to Zero Sum Gaming here at the Culture Cache. Role playing games are some of my favorite video games, and I love discovering new ones. That's exactly what happened when Patreon donor Greg Bateman wanted me to cover Star Ocean The Second Story. Now, I've got to say, if there's anything you want us to do, just let us know on Patreon. Whatever idea you have for this or any of our shows, we will take your ideas and put them into action. As for this game, RPGs tend to be pretty long affairs, so we'd better get started. I have to start out by saying that I don't think my video footage is quite up to snuff this time. For whatever reason, my capture card gets pretty finicky with PS1 games. I treat these episodes as video essays, and I try to show snippets of the game to illustrate my points. That won't quite be the case this time, and you have my apologies. Unfortunately, there's a bug in this game that made it even more difficult to capture the gameplay footage. There's a small chance after each battle that the game will freeze. It's a tiny chance, but considering this is an RPG and you'll fight literally thousands of battles, the game even keeps track of how many, you can see what a huge problem this is. This happened to me personally six times during my first playthrough. At first, I thought it was a problem with my disc. That's the risk you run buying a used 17-year-old game. But that's not it. Even people who rip this disc to play on an emulator still encounter the same problem. The glitch actually comes from the audio. After each battle, the characters have a small conversation. The game often loads all of these lines at the same time. It sounds a little weird, almost like everyone's talking and nobody is listening. Just like every political discussion ever! But it locks the game up if all these lines aren't fully delivered. Thankfully, there is a solution. Don't speed through all the post-battle stuff. If you wait until the camera stops moving and the characters stop talking, you'll be fine. It's a bit cumbersome at first, but once it becomes second nature, you'll hardly notice it. The audio actually presents another setback too. The voice acting just isn't very good. Some characters are okay. Thankfully, the two you'll hear the most, Claude and Reyna, sound decent, but some of the others get old fast. If it's possible to yell flatly, Celine does so. In fact, I may have even gimped myself by keeping her out of my party as much as possible purely to avoid her horrible voice. And she's not even the only one. Thankfully, the audio isn't universally bad. The sound effects are good and the music is great. The battle theme is very catchy and I've had it stuck in my head for the last few weeks. Different locations have fitting themes and the game certainly projects heroic expedition really well. The soundtrack costs about twice what the game does, but it really is epic, and while it certainly stands on its own well, it's even better at completing the total package that is this game. Similarly, the graphics are fantastic. The PlayStation 1 is noteworthy for being an early 3D polygon graphics-based game system. Emphasis on the word early. Most games on the system just don't look good today, those that do are the ones that opted to forego the then revolutionary graphics and stick with sprites. This is one such game. The character portraits and the menus look incredible and the sprites on the maps and in battle are well animated and very expressive. The only aspect of the graphics that looks dated at all is the world map, which uses those 3D graphics I was just talking about. This game didn't win any awards for visuals back in 99 but it's one of the best looking games on the system today because of the timeless appeal of the sprites. I actually need to take a quick aside for a moment. I have no idea how, but this game absolutely flew below my radar back in 1999. I legit don't know how either. Fighting games and RPGs are my favorite genres. All I can think of is that the larger releases of the year simply overshadowed this. We got the Sega Dreamcast, the first Smash Brothers, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, Lunar Silver Star Story Complete, Soul Calibur, and Final Fantasy VIII that year, among other things. That's no excuse, but I just played this game for the first time to bring you this content. Well, I had to switch discs, so let's shift gears onto another topic. Actually, I need to talk briefly about disc swapping in games. There's nothing wrong with it per se. I'd certainly rather have the entire game instead of getting it in installments. The only gripe 
is that it can disrupt the flow of the story. In this game, the end of the first disc is extremely climactic. Unfortunately, the simple knowledge that there is a second disc diminishes it. If you had no idea, it easily could have functioned as a false ending and it totally would have worked. It's sort of like watching a TV show where a character has cancer, but he's pictured on the box of the next season's DVD. Kinda takes the mystery out. But it's not really the game's fault. The break between discs makes perfect sense, unlike many other PS1 games. And this game's story is great. I can't say that it's the best I've ever seen, but it's above average. Most RPGs fall clearly into the realm of either fantasy or sci-fi. With a title like Star Ocean, you won't be surprised to find sci-fi, but it also does an excellent job with the fantasy. It perfectly intermarries the two, and how it does so is simply brilliant. It's set in our own universe, but in the future, hence the interstellar travel. It's pretty smart how it goes about this. It doesn't really bog the game down with all the details, but what the game does use makes sense. It seems to use some real life theory and some ideas from Star Trek, which likely won't upset anyone playing this game anyway. It even hints at the Prime Directive early on, as Claude is hesitant to use his phase gun on the primitive planet of Expel. In fact, when he does use it, it sets into motion the traditional fantasy element of the game. RPGs love the tried-and-true prophecy to drive the story forward. Expel has one such prophecy about the warrior, who will save the world with his sword of life. When people do spot Claude using his trusty sidearm, they have no knowledge of such technology, so they assume it to be the sword of light, and by proxy, that Claude is the warrior. I don't want to spoil anything else, as the story goes to some pretty amazing places. Again, it's not the best ever, but it's more than worth your time. The settings of the game are ideal. They're wide and varied. The game takes place across multiple planets. Hopefully the title was your first clue to that, but the locations genuinely look, sound, and feel different from each other. You'll see tiny backwoods villages, mining towns, magnificent castles, bustling ports, holy temples, and more. And that was only on a single planet, and off the top of my head. And the pre-rendered backgrounds look so good that many could function as standalone paintings. Heck, Thomas Kincaid made a career out of painting things like this. But enough of all the fluffy stuff. Let's get into the real meat and potatoes of the game. Role-playing video games stem directly from tabletop RPGs. This came up in the companion article I wrote for this game at theculturecache.com, so I'll include a link in the description. Star Ocean in particular does a great job staying true to these roots. Amassing experience points to gain levels is par for the course in these games, but often, character growth is set in stone at level up, or it's random, but still follows specific formulas. That's true in Star Ocean to an extent, but the system is much deeper than that. At level up, and at a few other times, you receive skill points for your characters. You spend these points on various skills such as playing a musical instrument, hitting below the belt, writing, and all manner of other things. This feels so much like the White Wolf gaming engine, it's not even funny. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You might be wondering why you should ever spend these precious points on something like whistling or poker face. Carry that, carry that. These skills fall into three categories. Some are battle skills. These are 100% combat oriented. You'll find things like strong blow that knocks back your target when you hit it, preventing possible counterattacks, or motor mouth, which speeds up your spell casting. Then there are those that are used with special commands. Aesthetic sense may not offer you any benefit during battle, but it helps empower your art and metalwork. This, naturally, begs the question why you should care about those things. Well, metalwork can be used to craft armor from raw materials, and art can create consumable items. There are lots of these types of abilities, and Smart Money says you'll want to have each of your characters specialize in one of them so that you can access as many of them as possible. 
Finally, there are some skills that raise your stats. These stat boosters are usually needed for specialties as well, but you benefit directly simply by raising the skill. Some, like Functionality and Kitchen Knife, are excellent and worth spending points on even if you never intend to use the related special commands. For example, Kitchen Knife grants you 20 strength points per level, so even if Ashton is afraid of the kitchen, you'll still want him to be handy with a knife. Cartman's favorite skill, Poker Face, gives him three Guts points, though I think his gut's big enough already, and it's one of the skills you need in order to pickpocket. Thankfully, Eric doesn't have any courage. Of course, all the skills in the world only mean so much. If you lack the talents, you're still going to produce subpar results. Imagine trying to cook, but lacking a sense of taste. Just like a Kane Tendo! You get the idea. Each character has a certain selection of talents assigned semi-randomly and can learn more through repetition, but not all characters can learn all talents. Opera, for example, can never have love of animals. Hilariously, on my first playthrough, Chisato, a journalist by trade, did not have the writing talent. I guess she'd fit right in with her own real-world journalists. So you have one character with the talents and skills to play a violin. Great, but what's better than that? How about when the rest of the party accompanies them with their own instrumentation? This game also has super specialties that involve your entire party. Remember, these things all start with your skills. Now do you see how important the decision of how to spend your skill points is? This is only one aspect of Star Ocean that really sets it apart from the RPG pack. Another is the battle system. It's incredibly active, especially for an RPG. Instead of choosing everything from menus and watching the battle play out, you have commands directly mapped to specific buttons on your controller. Did an enemy just throw a knife at you? Don't just take the hit. You may be able to dodge it, or better yet, if you see a bad guy prepping an attack, if you hit him before he can execute it, you could prevent the assault entirely. Given the active nature of the battle system, you only control one character directly, and the AI takes care of the rest. You have some say over their actions, though. You can set which killer moves your fighter characters will use, and which spells your mages will. You can also assign a broad behavior to each character, such as attack with all MP or heal allies. Even with all this, the AI can be downright idiotic at times, so keep an eye on the rest of your party. Each location has a unique battlefield. Sometimes it's a generic rectangle with only cosmetic differences, but often there are functional differences. For example, this mine has occasional carts running down the tracks, and they damage anything in their paths, friend or foe alike. It's another cool way to really make this game distinctive. Though there can be occasional glitches with the battles. I never encountered anything permanent, but I was able to jump so high that I removed Claude from battle for a while before he eventually fell back down. My frame of reference for this game is a bit unfair. I kept thinking, this game feels a lot like Tales of Destiny. When I looked into it though, it made perfect sense. This game was developed by Tri-Ace, so named because of the three aces who founded the company, Yoshiharu Gotanda, Masaki Norimoto, and Joe Asunuma. Actually, this game marked Asunuma's departure from the company, but the other two are still there today. These three men used to work for Wolf Team, the company that developed Tales of Fantasia back in 1995. If you've played some Tales games and some Star Oceans and wondered why they feel so similar, now you know! And knowing is half the battle. Another thing the Star Ocean and Tales games have in common is the use of cooking. Most of the healing items in this game are foods. You can buy some of them from the various stores and restaurants in the towns, but it's much more efficient to make your own. Once more, it harkens back to your skills. But it's a great way to keep your party healthy and wealthy. You can buy ingredients on the cheap and fry them up into something amazing for profit. Each food heals a specific percentage of HP or MP, but each character also has a favorite food that instantly restores both to full. The characters in this game are fun and colorful. They're simply bursting with personality, and they really liven the game up. They're believable and varied. 
and they offer a lot of replay value to the game, since there are 12 of them, but you can only get 8 on a single playthrough. An RPG with replay value? That's nearly unheard of! I know I said I wouldn't say too much about the story, and that's true, but I do need to revisit it again briefly. Just as this game manages to bridge fantasy and sci-fi, it also merges religion and technology. As written, it's a really cool concept, but sadly, the original PlayStation version is pretty heavily censored. There's a continent called El and a town called Eluria. El means God. Think of the biblical angels, Gabriel, Michael, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel. Gabriel is the messenger of God. Michael is who is like God etc. These characters appear, along with many others such as Metatron and Lucifer, in the story, but their names are changed. It removes a major element of the plot to take the religious allegory out. Thankfully, the PSP remake, Star Ocean's Second Evolution, restores this missing element as well as offering better voice acting. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea. There are some flaws with the game, but it's still excellent. The story is good, even with a major motif toned down. The battle system is fun and invigorating, the settings are inventive and diverse, and the game lasts a long, long time. Extra, extra, extra long time. Is Star Ocean the second story worth it? The game goes for about 25 bucks, though you might be able to find it a little cheaper than that. You get so much play time for that investment, oh yeah, it's definitely worth it. The game's going to be 50 hours to maybe even up to 100. Oh yeah. And when you finish the first quest, there's a second quest on this one too. A double pleasure's waiting for you. No, I'm not gonna do that to you twice in a row. Thanks for watching. the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise.